Hey everyone, thank you very much for joining me, but not only are you joined by me, I'm very happy, excited and honoured to bring on a phenomenal guest, a man with the plan, a man who has designed so well for emotions that constantly inspired me and also was able to spend time with him as he's come to conferences, picked his brain and I've been given another chance to be joined by the ever wonderful, the fantastic Ken Wong. Thank you. How are you doing, mate? Hey, Max. I'm doing really good. Uh, it's really good to talk to you, buddy. And you, mate. So those of you who don't know, Ken is the creative director of Mountains, which is your game studio, mate, which is known for Florence. Before that, you were the lead designer of Monument Valley at Us Two Games, mate. It's a pleasure to have you and just to be talking with you, mate. So again, just thank you for joining. I want to ask you know, how's it been with all the change of obviously COVID, all of that? How, how have you found this? Uh, yeah, um, so I'm, I'm based in Australia, um, which is where I'm from. And, uh, you know, earlier we were talking about um, how making games can sometimes take you around the world. Um, so, yeah. you know, if you yourself have experienced that, um, I've been very fortunate that I've gotten to work um, in a lot of places, but I ended up back in Australia and Australia's had a pretty good time of COVID. Um, uh, we've had really hard lockdowns, but I think like the majority of Australians agree that that's the way to go. And, and, uh, you know, really the, yeah. the, uh, in, the impact has been, has been minimized. So, um, so yeah, I, I, and I'm myself, like I'm, I'm quite an introvert. I quite like to stay at home and, you know, be on my computer all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I got back into Lego recently, so oh, um, brilliant! Yeah, so the pandemic has has not been too bad for me. What's uh, which sets of uh, has excited you the most with Lego, then, mate? But first, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. <laughs> today's sponsor is none other than me. What I've done, everyone, and I hope you're excited for this, is I've actually created a level design kind of store. What I've done in this store is put up different kinds of tips and tricks that you can find there, whether that be my actual ebook itself to that of level design pamphlets focused on different things such as traversal, stealth, breaking into the industry, as well as different talks that I have done which you cannot find anywhere else other than on this store. So if you are looking to improve on your level design skills and processes, then check out the level design store, which will be down in the description below where there'll be a link to find this. All you need to do is head over to gumroad.com forward slash level design lobby. I hope you like what you see and I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you. And now back to the show. Uh, you know, like last weekend, I, I put together uh, the most recent uh, Luke Skywalker's X-Wing. Oh, really? Uh, classic, classic. And then, uh, yeah. but I think some of your listeners might, might uh, if they're not aware, um, Nintendo and Lego just cooperated on uh, a question mark block from Super mm. Mario 64. And that's a really great set. Um, oh, really? It's... Um, a lot of people pick on it because in Mario 64, there isn't actually a question mark. It's actually a, an exclamation mark block in that game. <laughs> but they felt like the question mark was so iconic, they had to do that. Yeah. And it, it looks just like a block from the outside, but there's it's actually got levels hidden within it. So, um, yeah, very relevant to level designers. Oh, that's brilliant, mate. How long does it take you to put that together? Uh, that one, like, I, I spread it out over, like, a couple of evenings. Um, do, do you have you done any Lego recently? Recently, yet? I have done, mate. I have. I got the uh, so I did first one that I got like backed me into it was uh, the Minecraft set. So I got into that. Oh, yeah. I then got the uh, Guardians Galaxy uh, ship that they did for one oh, yeah. two, which I absolutely love that. And then uh, it was I think it's called the Milano. And then I recently took a, a pretty penny from me, but I've been saving up. <laughs> 
trying to get that Disney castle one because obviously it's just very <laughs> iconic as well. But trying to find that and obviously at a reasonable price is a, a very tough one to do. So still saving up for that one. So yeah, I've recently got back into it myself. Yeah, already, cool. So, you know, I, I yeah. love that. Um, I feel like Lego has a lot in common with game development. Um, oh, yeah. You know, it's creative, but it's engineering at the same time. You're doing a lot of problem mm. solving. You're, you know, sort of balancing aesthetics and functionality. Um, but uh, it's also tactile. And I think that's yeah. something that I've really missed in my creative work because I'm, I'm so digital based. So yeah. uh, d- rediscovering Lego has sort of helped, like, I think, kind of balance out my, my creative output. <laughs> No, I think it's so spot on, mate. One of the things that I've been looking at getting into is I've just been watching people paint and create uh, like Warhammer models. Oh, yeah. And it's that same same thing of, I, I don't particularly want to play the game or anything, but it's that looking at that tactile feeling of putting it together. Uh, I've also got some like Porsche model kits and some other like Gundam, Gunpla ones as well. So I know what you mean. It's nice to actually oh, nice. feel it while you do it as well, which I think is... Uh, a, a big missing element of, of kind of what we do, right? Definitely. And I wanted to to ask, mate, do you mind giving a bit more of a, an introduction to how you got into games, mate? Because we've talked about, about Lego, but what is it that inspired you through your whole creative endeavor? Um, well, let, let me first ask you a question. Um, mm. Do you remember when we first met? I do, yeah, and I'm trying to remember the year, but because I remember when you first came, it was just when you were getting ready to release that of uh, Alice, Re- it was Alice Returns, because you were out in Hong Kong, if I remember correctly, at that time. Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll go back to the beginning, but ba- you know, basically, we go, back, we go back quite a few years, don't we? Yeah, man, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the way I got started in games was um, I, I studied multimedia at university, um, not really with the intention of getting into games. I, I thought I would end up in web development or something. Mm-hmm. And this was, uh, I graduated in 2004. Um, but during university, I was getting on my digital art skills. So I was, I was online and, and sort of um, hanging out on forums and, and learning Photoshop techniques and just l- listening to, to um, experienced illustrators and graphic designers and, and comic artists and just soaking up as much knowledge as I, as I can, mm. uh, as I could, sorry. And um, uh, so, and I had, I had a little bit of a digital art portfolio and um, in the year 2000, so we're going back 22 years now, there was a game called American McGee's Alice, which yeah. for those who don't know, it was a, a a dark, twisted take on Alice in Wonderland, which was pretty novel for the time. And I was really excited about this game, and I did some fan art. And the designer of the game, whose name is American McGee, saw my fan art online and wrote to me and asked if I would like to try doing some designs for his new, his latest game. And uh, that was that was amazing. And I said, yes, and, you know, I... Uh, that's how I got my first freelance gig. And then we worked together for a, a little while. And American asked if uh, if he could jump on the project that he was working on in Hong Kong. Um, and so that, and that's how I landed, landed my first full-time job. Um, and I didn't know anything about Hong Kong at the time. And I, mm. I, I wasn't even interested in traveling. But that's, that's how I got the travel bug. Um, and so I, I um, actually, what happened was I I moved to Hong Kong, I started my job, and then I think like on the third week of my job, I had to like take a break because I'd been invited to speak at a conference in uh, in the northeast of England <laughs> called the Animex uh, Animation and Games Festival, um, yeah. based at the University of Teesside. Um, I, what happened was they, they invited American and American like doesn't really like doing speaking engagement. So he's like, Ken should go, Ken should go and talk about concept art or something. And I, you know, this is me. Like I barely know anything about game development. You know, I mm-hmm. just started my first job and, um, 
But I'm like, hey, I'd, I'd like to go to the UK. That sounds cool. Mm. And so that was the first time that I, I spoke at Animex. Um, and uh, they liked me enough that they uh, kept inviting me back. And, yeah, um, and a couple of years later, that's where I met you. Um, yeah, you, were, you, were, you were helping out at the festival, if I remember correctly. Yeah, mate. I was uh, what they called a, a red shirt <laughs> at the event. So we would try, like, obviously help out by uh, anything that the speakers needed. We'd try help with and try answer any questions as well as uh, I think you know, when, you, when you do your Q&A sections of your talk, run around with the microphone and try yeah. to get over the stairs too much. <laughs> but yeah, it was a red shirt back in the day, but yeah. I was I still remember your talk, man. I still remember it, yeah. Wow. Oh wow. Um and I, I gotta say, like, um that was such a good way. Like the way that the festival got um because it was based at a university. So yeah. um asking the some of the students to volunteer their time to help out mm. around the festival. It was such a good way um, to get to know, um, you know, the speakers. Um, yeah. Like, like the red shirts would, we would, uh, we'd go to lunch together. We would, mm-hmm. um, they drive us around. Um, they, we'd hang out in the green room, and mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm, we, I ended up being friends with a lot of students from Animex. Um, yeah, man. And I'm, I'm, and I'm friends with, um, with a lot of people that I met there. So. Um, I feel, um, very blessed that sort of parallel to my career of making games, I've also had this, I've been really fortunate to have this parallel career of of speaking about games and, and getting to meet amazing, amazing, um, speakers and students and people who are passionate about creating games. You know, like right up until today, you know, getting getting to talk to you, it feels very full circle. And I'm I'm so happy to to hear about how your career has gone so well and 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 you know, doing this podcasting as well. Like I think you must feel the same that like mm. making games, but then also talking about making games is like it's a good way to reflect on on what we do. Oh dude, yeah. And like y- you know, I you, you know, I still remember when we, I think it was the last uh, Animex that, that we met at, you know, we had a, a good talk. You gave me some solid advice and that was, you know, part of some of the inspirations on why I wanted to do uh, a podcast. That and my writing is absolutely terrible. But <laughs> the the element of getting to meet people like yourself and, and others at these events, right? And especially at the at the time where, you know, level design's growing, but there wasn't many speakers uh, at, at the, when I was in university. So yeah, mate, to to be able to give back, as you're saying, and to meet these incredible people, whether they be that of students or other speakers or, or having guests on like yourself, mate, it's, it's an incredible, rewarding, but also just constantly like learning element, right? Because you, you're never going to know it all and getting to speak to more people, it only inspires you more, mate. So I completely and utterly <laughs> agree with that, mate. Yeah, it's a strange... How old were you when you moved to Hong Kong then, mate? Uh, I was 22, I think. Damn, dude. So you went pretty pretty young then, like out into the... So I was 25 when I moved abroad. So how yeah. did you find... Because I think that's something that we don't talk about is you get incredible opportunities, as we talked about, to, to go see the world and work with many different people from over the globe. How did you find moving abroad at such a time? Um, so like I said, I, I, I didn't know anything about Hong Kong. Um, mm. uh, and a friend of mine said, oh, it's going to be cool. It's going to be like living in Blade Runner. And I'm like, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> but um, yeah, as it, as it turns out, like I, um, I, you know, prior to that, I'd been living um, with my dad and, uh, and it's sort of been living a bit of a sheltered life, you know, like I went to university, but I didn't move away for it. And so all at once, like I, I moved out of home. Um, and I moved into a, a new country and had to figure out how to how to rent an apartment and 
Mm. Uh, there was a little bit of a language barrier, but like for the most part, people speak um, can can understand or speak English in in Hong Kong. Uh, but the the culture shock of like uh, it's a really dense city. It's really really busy. Um, it's really humid, which turns a lot of people off. But it makes me feel like I'm in a sauna all the time. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, the food is amazing. The shopping malls were epic. Um, there is, you know, and yet it's like really close by to nature. Like there's a lot of hiking and yeah. um, and forests around Hong Kong and, and beaches. Um, so it was it was like it was a big adventure, really. Um, you know, and and amongst that, you know, like learning how to work at a games company for the first time. Um, mm. I don't think that company exists anymore. It was called Enlight, um, right. but they were oh they were they were situated in the red light district of Hong Kong, <laughs> which was which was very interesting. So like you know walking to work in the morning, but then when I left <laughs> work in the evening, you know suddenly all the bars had had their lights on and and like yeah. uh, that was just that was just really surreal, I guess. I can um, imagine, maybe. That would yeah. make you feel more like Blade Runner. <laughs> yeah, yeah kind of. Well, and it really opened my eyes up to, like, how how big the world is, you know? Like, up until that mm. point, I'd, I'd lived my whole life in, in Australia and I had very rarely gone overseas. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've been really fortunate to... Um, to get to travel and you know after Hong Kong I, I moved to Shanghai for five years and then um, and then London for three years and then Melbourne for five years and now I'm back in my hometown at Lover Design Lobby we believe everybody has a story to tell hobbyist or student freelancer or veteran we made it our mission to unite those who share our passion for creating and developing great games Thanks to our generous Patreon backers, we've been able to do just that. So if you've already pledged your support, thank you. If not, you too can ensure the future of Level Design Lobby, helping us to create even more exciting content, collaborations, interviews, and much more. With awesome perks and rewards, whether you're a seasoned professional or just getting started, you're sure to find something for you. Want to share tips, tricks, and advice with passionate, like-minded developers? Our awesome community Discord has you covered. Fancy practicing your level design, creating strong portfolio content, and having fun? Then try our level design weekends. Or perhaps you want to individually discuss your work, hone your skills, or level up your career? Then consider our one-on-one -on -one mentorships. If you share our vision, then go to patreon.com forward slash level design lobby for more information and to pledge your support. Thank you. Oh, mate, you've, seen a, you've seen a lot, which, again great experience in its own right and i think it just shows again how international games are right and if you are someone looking for adventure you can you can get that in in its own way of seeing the world and i was wondering because i've definitely learned a lot from my time moving away did it inspire you or change kind of your artwork or how you design or anything like that i'm curious oh that's a really good question um I, it's really hard for me to untangle like travel and life mm. and my creative work because, you know, they all evolve together and it's hard yeah. for me to think of myself of like wh who I would be if it, if it wasn't for those things. Mm. Um, you know, I, th I think that traveling was always full of new experiences, you know, like learning languages, exploring new cities, tasting new foods. I, I'm the same with with art and design. Like I, I just crave like new ideas and like finding out about new artists and, and learning new tools. And I guess it's the same with games. Like I'm always looking mm. for um, for new things and surprises. I think surprise is like a a really key feature that um, that I learned when I was working in Shanghai on um, on um, Alice Manish Returns, which was the sequel to the first Alice game. Um, mm. I was, I got to be the art director of, of that. And, um, um, I'll never forget, like 
my colleague uh, Paul Karofsky, he, you know, we we had this like six six world structure to the game. And he was always pushing to like mix it up a, a little bit, you know, mix up the pacing so that it wasn't it wasn't just like six worlds of like equal length that, you know, and sometimes we would break up like the 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 pacing of it and and like introduce sort of like it, like chapters in between so that players didn't didn't quite know to, what to expect. And I that's a lesson that I always that I, I really took away from that that um, the the play experience is not just about setting up a structure that that people can expect. But and, uh, but yeah, but giving them surprise and sometimes breaking that structure. Mm. Yeah, no, mate. And I, when speaking about design, I said to you already before we start recording, there's one element of design like I really just wanted to get excited and fanboy and, and pick your brain about is designing for emotions. Now, anyone who's been listening to this show uh, for a while knows that I'm a big fan of your game, your team's game, Florence. And I just really wanted to to talk about how you incorporated, you know, the emotions of relationship and conveying them through that of a mobile phone with its different forms of inputs. And I guess, how did you all come up and design, design with those in mind? Like what inspired those? Um, wow, it's a really broad question <laughs> yeah i should have uh, i should have started uh, i think the the one that i'm really interested in, to give it a little bit more context is it was the it was the conversation and the arguments one of the things mm-hmm. that i thought was really well done was because you it was the same thing when you when they go on the first date the the bubbles are, are set up into like five pieces then it gets down to two and then one as if it's shown like the bond's been being put together and then it was the same with arguments, but the screen tilted on who had spoke, like who had mm. responded or connected the bubbles faster. I was just blown away by that and just wondering how did you, yeah, how did you come up with these great ideas, mate? Yeah. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a couple of ways to talk about it. Um, mm. I think the, like initially when we came up with the idea of, um, let's let's tell the story of a relationship, kind of like um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind or mm. Five Hundred Days of Summer. So, like that's the goal. We want to tell a story about both the ups and downs of a of a of a relationship. Um, clearly, you can break that into into beats or chapters. Um, mm. And I was used to the the sort of chapter structure from my previous work on Monument Valley. Um, so, you know, if you, if you write the story of a, um, a generic or a typical relationship, you might have like how, how the two characters meet, um, you know, their, their first couple of dates, um, moving in together, but then also arguing and then drifting apart, that, that kind of thing. Right. Mm. Um, and so that became the goal of each chapter or each level. It's like, how do we how do we not just portray that the characters are going through this, but how do we make that interactive in order to bring the player into that experience so that they are feeling what the characters are feeling? You know, it's one thing for the character to say, oh, I'm really happy about this. This is great. (laughs) Um, But if if you can get the player to to feel that themselves without even telling them that that's what's happening, you know, using... the What I learned from being an illustrator is that um, unspoken uh, communication or unspoken art can be so, so powerful, right? Like depicting something with um, artwork or with music, um, it, it, I, I feel like what happens is the player's mind has to fill in the blanks. Like they have to interpret what's going on in the music and the, and the art and, and, because they're engaging that their imagination, they're engaging empathy, and they they are imagining what the character is feeling. Um, so, to take a little step back, um, the 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 level that you mentioned, um, mm-hmm. which is called first dates, uh, yeah. was a was a really tricky level to 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 uh, come up with, and we went through a lot of trial and error. Um, 
with this. I, I felt like we were we were doing something a little bit unorthodox. You know, this is not typical game design or level design where you're trying to create challenges for the player. And yeah. you know, like typically when you're telling a story, you're um, you're using dialogue or you're using decisions. You know, your your decision trees, um, or you're using environmental storytelling. Um, I think environmental storytelling is probably the closest thing to what we're doing, but um, there's this layer on top where we don't have a core mechanic, right? There, the mechanic mm -hmm. is totally up to us um, to design per level. Um, so in the case of first dates, I was trying to trying to find something about first dates that that felt um, like what it feels like when you when you're going on your first date with someone, and I just thought about. Um, you know, my experience and, and kind of feeling really nervous and, and not knowing what to say. Um, but then there's this process of like, when you really click with someone, it starts becoming easier to speak mm -hmm. to them. And I thought that, uh, you know, uh, we ended up using a lot of metaphors in the game. So puzzle pieces mm -hmm. could be a metaphor for coming up with the words to say. So that's why at the, you know, at the very start of the day, it, it, it takes a long time to put that, to put together the first puzzle, which is like putting together the sentence of what to say to this beautiful boy who's in front of you at the cafe. <laughs> but, you know, as the dates go on, there's fewer pieces, it gets easier. And I knew in the back of my mind that like the, the music would also be like kind of escalating. I know you, you'd also talk to, to Kevin Penkin who did the music. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so I knew that, you know, Kef was going to come through and, and help on the music front. And uh, yeah, that it ended up, uh, I, I guess, like, uh, you know, like, in, like the, the final thing to say about it is the, the level gets easier and easier and, and you kind of have to work against your traditional game instincts to design something like that, right? Because traditionally, you you want to build up the challenge, you're working up towards a boss or, you know, you, you're making the levels harder and harder. And that's just not necessary with, um, with storytelling necessarily, you know, um, mm. there's certainly an aspect of Florence of playing Florence that gets sort of more difficult or grittier yeah. as you go along, but it's not, it's not the, uh, it's not what you're doing with your hands. It's not the, it's not the tactile, um, challenge. Um, and, you know, I, I think we took that even further when it came to a later level called letting go where, um, uh, spoilers, but, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the Florence and Krish have broken up and Florence now has to let go of Krish. And I thought the way to do that is you have to just not touch the screen at all, but, I know that our players, like, you know, most mobile players are, are conditioned to tap on the screen all the time and try to, try to solve things, right? So I was guessing that people would probably try to interact and try to do things, but that would always reset you. Um, so it's, uh, I, I thought it was really, really interesting to say, like, you actually have to do nothing. You have to just back off. I'm sure I stole that yeah. from another game now that I'm talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> mate, like it was some great design, honestly, mate. Like I was blown away. I must have replayed it, I think, around about 10 times or just shy of. Oh my yeah. God. Thank you. You know, I honestly, mate, like blown away by, I think, in terms of design and just overall, like you said, feel and emotions. It's like, it for me, it's one of my favorites. And, I, like I said, that's, that's part of the reason why I wanted you on here because I've been itching to ask questions for you, to you about this stuff for ages, mate, because as you said, you, you, you've, you had to break some of the convention. You said going against making it harder. I remember that bit of like letting go and communicating through, as you said, using metaphors, but you just captured that feeling of going through your relationships so well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, mate. I just to you, to you and everyone who works on it, mate. Honestly, an incredible job. And I said I'm fanboying at this. Point. <laughs> you Thank know, you. I, I love it. Uh, I don't know if you've had this experience, but sometimes it feels like um, the game is just needs to emerge. Like it's something that has a life of its own, and you're just mm -hmm. the person 
who's witnessing it and you're you're kind of just helping it come out into the world and that's yeah. that's kind of how it felt to me like i uh i'm really proud of my work on florence and i and mm. i hope the you know the rest of the team that they're all proud of 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 what we achieved but it 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 feels like um I don't know. When I play the game, I'm I'm also kind of astonished. I'm like, wow, that was really cool. That's a that's a neat <laughs> idea. Like, you know, and I I wish that I could say that I had this master plan and and I had this all in my head, but I didn't. You know, there, like I said, there were so many ideas that I thought would work that didn't, and so it was it was actually quite a, a tough development. Like we had to like iterate a lot, like trying all of these like emotional metaphors. Um, yeah. Um, I guess partly because we we didn't have a lot of um, reference to look at. Um, right. You know, I I actually haven't played the most games, so like potentially there was stuff that we could be borrowing from. But um, I was more borrowing from the language of film. Um, you know, things that I'd seen in movies, things that I'd seen in art and comic books. Um, uh, which is, you know, which works for Florence because it's quite a linear, um, quite cinematic mm -hmm. game. I think that's a great point though, just on about like how we can take inspiration from so many different places, right? And I was going to ask when you're gathering all your your references, is there a certain, mm, I mean, I guess it depends on the games or the, the piece that you're working on, but how, what, what helps you find the inspiring references for, for anything? Uh, well, Pinterest is a is a, a sort of a, a big tool that I use. Um, mm. I um, again, I'm I'm very art based. I I'm you know I still draw. I still do illustrations from time to time, and I'm very visually focused. So when I think of when I'm working on a project, I'm sort of I actually the I jump on Pinterest and I and I find references. But the great thing about Pinterest is that the algorithm is really, really good at at suggesting similar works. Yeah. So sometimes you like you just you find something that's vaguely in the right direction, but then Pinterest will show you like a hundred things that it thinks are like similar, and it's pretty good at that. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, Pinterest is a good tool for me. Like we used that on Florence, we used it on Monument Valley. Um, and something I picked up on when I was at us two working on, on Monument Valley was, was printing out references from um, from Pinterest and, and you know creating physical real world mood boards and just putting them up around the office. Um, mm. So um, even though I started as a concept artist, I don't do much concept art right now um, anymore. Like I actually like to surround myself with references and then just go straight into the into the into making the game from that. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. I want to ask me because you've you've been through and had so many different roles in in games. For some people, a lot of people obviously aspire to to be a creative director or director in their certain field. What would advice would you give to them, or how would you and how would you describe the role of a, a creative director as well, please, mate? Sure. Um, so I think an experience that a lot of people are missing out on now is um, yeah. working at bigger studios. Um, right. Like I, I, I think it's so great that the indie games um, space exists and that people mm. are starting companies with their friends and starting, you know, studios and, and just, and creating teams and working on their passion projects. Um, I feel like I really benefited from working at a couple of different studios before I, I did that. Um, like just learning, learning from other people was so, so valuable, like being around people who are way more experienced than me and had different skill sets um, was, was really good. Um, so I think that's a, that's a big, um, that's, a, that's one bit of advice. I think another thing I would say is, um, draw inspiration from just from your life and the world around you. Um, yeah. you know, I've, like I, like I said, I, I, 
Um, I draw from a lot of art that I'm passionate about, from stories that I enjoy. Um, and I actually think that not playing games so much anymore has, has actually helped me as a game designer because mm. I don't, I don't usually, uh, games aren't my primary reference. Like when I'm designing games, I don't, I'm not really talking about other games so much. Um, I'm, I start with something I'm interested in, let's say, um, bicycles. Like I've always wanted to make a game about, about, um, having a bicycle or like riding bicycles. And mm. people definitely do that. Um, but if you, if you, if you based your game or my, if I was basing my game on the other bicycle games that I've played, then I might subconsciously borrow from them or I might, I might assume that, okay, there, there's, right. this is how you make a bicycle game. But I think if you start with what, what I personally like about bicycles, you know, like my experience of bicycles was, um, a lot of it was, riding around Shanghai and like, mm. um, which is like a really busy city, but you get to see so many side streets, um, when you're on a bicycle and, um, uh, yeah. And so like, I think whatever your experience is, um, uh, it's, you could make a game out of that. You know, you can tell a story, you can make it interactive, you can share that with people. And, uh, um, there's, I, I think, I think, uh, the, the reason that emo like games that portray emotions are like, um, sort of on the rise right now is because they weren't earlier on in the industry, like. In, in the, uh, you know, in the nineties, in the, in the early 2000s, the eighties, it was just hard to portray emotions. Like we, we were limited by technology. We were limited by, uh, just gaming culture at the time. Like gaming culture wasn't as interested in exploring emotions and depicting emotions and, yeah. and, and having, exploring relationships. And so that there just wasn't an, so much of an interest in that. And, um, you know, the games industry has been sort of dominated by, uh, by other things, by other factors. And I think this is why diversity is so important, right? Like mm. um, games sh can and should depict all of human experience, um, not just headshots. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I, I think finally, like right now, like, um, we're, we're developing the vocabulary to talk about these games. We're establishing um, references, like we're, we're finding cool mechanics and, and, um, you know, key texts, uh, like gone home, for example, like gone home, mm. I think was like really revealing to me, like gone home made me cry. And I, you know, I was, uh, I was surprised cause I like the kind of game gone home is, I didn't, I didn't think would work on me so well, but it, it yeah. totally did. Um, so it's an exciting time. I, um, you know, I, I think that um, I'm excited for your listeners and, and all the amazing things that they can create and what they can bring to the table. Yeah, mate. Oh, it's great to hear, man. And on that note, we're going to wrap this up, mate. But I just want to say thank you again for coming on, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's been a while since we've probably sat down, probably sat down and spoke. So it's been <laughs> great to hear from you, champ. And yeah. yeah, if anyone wants to reach out and get in contact to see what you're doing, how best to, to do so, mate? Um, so the best way to for people to contact me is probably through Twitter. I'm at Ken Wong Art at Twitter. And my studio is called Mountains, and we are at Mountains Games. Fantastic, mate. I'll put a link to all of these down below for people to check out. So thank you again, mate. Max, can I give a, a bit of a, can I have a shout out? Oh, of course, sure, go for it, champ. Yeah, I just want to shout out Gabby Ken for uh, oh, God. for yeah. inviting me to Animex in the first place. And uh, you know, if it wasn't for Gabby, I wouldn't have met so many incredible people, yourself included. And um, yeah, if she's listening, I hope she's doing well, and I hope to catch up with her soon once once uh, COVID permits. 
That's sure, man. No, Gabby's absolutely a. So that reminds me, I need to make sure I grab her onto the podcast very soon oh, <laughs> as that's well. Totally soon, for sure, for sure. No, brilliant shout out, brilliant. Yeah, we send our love to Gabby because she's uh, she's ace, done so much for many people. I think. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. If you want to reach out to me, you can do so as well on Twitter. I'm at Max Pez. If you want to email in any questions, you can do so at leveldesignlobby at gmail.com. So thank you all very much. Awesome. All right, well, then we'll wrap it on up. Take care, everyone, and we'll catch you all next time.